Hey everyone, thanks for clicking on the video. Today we have a great interview with Benjamin who dropped out of med school to pursue a career in software engineering and in five months landed his first position uh, after learning Python primarily. So getting into tech has been so ambiguous for me and I found that there's so little info just in general that is clear and not full of a sales pitch in regards to how to actually get into the field. So I've been reaching out to some of you to try to get some more insight. Benjamin, it was very gracious of you to uh, give part of your morning up to talk with me. So thank you. And I hope that you guys find some value from this conversation. Benjamin, thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. So in this discussion, I just kind of wanted to get um, a general idea of your story, you know, as as uh, as you know, we we met on Reddit. I just reached out to you cold, essentially. And uh, in a paragraph or two, you had a story that really uh, inspired me. And and that's frankly why I reached out in the first place. So if I can just ask first broadly, um, where did you come from professionally? And why did you make the switch into tech? Uh, professionally, I came from a medical background. I had gotten into UC Irvine as a pharmacology major, and I was kind of bouncing back and forth between various different pre-health uh, career paths. I started off as a uh, pre-pharmacy student, um, but, you know, as I got deeper into my studies, I kind of figured, you know, I think I find medicine a bit more interesting in practice. So I eventually became pre-med, and uh, I did a lot of research in undergrad. Uh, got published in a few fields, and then graduated, took two gap years just to really spruce up my resume, get experience, work with physicians in their offices. Um, I worked as a as a pediatric medical assistant for three years, front and back office. And um, yeah, went through the whole uh, MCAT standardized testing for medical school, did interviews, and um, I eventually got into medical school. But, you know, there had been a lot of things along the way that were kind of red flags for me. Of course, you know, after have, after shadowing a ton of doctors, I realized that a lot of them weren't exactly happy. And, um, you know, I have this one little moment where my doctor told um, one of my coworkers, you know, she, she had asked him, like, hey, doctor, his name was Dr. Mike. Hey, Dr. Mike, uh, are you happy being a physician? would you tell your kids to do the same thing? Cause she was also pre-med and he said, God, no, it's Christina, go do something else. Go be happy. Uh, I thought that was kind of funny. He was joking, but you know, you could tell that there was some truth to that. Um, but the, ultimately the straw that broke the camel's back for me was the, was the American healthcare system. Uh, I had to turn away, you know, long story short, I had to turn away a baby once because they were out of network with our insurance and that wasn't very fun. So, you know, I had uh, decided you know, after having already gotten to medical school, I was a weekend. I had told myself, you know, it's now or never. Like, I'm going to keep trying to justify all this hard work to get into medical school. Next thing you know, I'm 50 years old and I'm not happy. Let's just get out of it while I'm 25 years old, you know. So I dropped out with no plan of knowing what to do what to do next. But then, you know, through a, through a random series of very fortunate happenstance, uh, slash unfortunate at the time, but you know, there's a silver lining. Of course, my girlfriend had broken up with me. Um, I had decided to uh, go on Tinder when I was ready to start dating again. And I met somebody who um, introduced me to her friend. We were at a bar and he was a software engineer who worked at Zillow. And I was like, Oh, you know, I, I don't know, really know what to do with my life. I'm kind of like just looking around and seeing what interests me. Like, can you tell me a little bit about software engineering? And then he invited me out to a coffee shop. Uh, he sat me down, he opened up the terminal, he typed PWD, and it was the most hacker thing I've ever seen in my life. It was just like the movies, the terminal shell, you know, with the green text and the back black background. And um, I was like, you know, tell me more, how do I get into this stuff? He sent me home with a book called Learn Python the Hard Way. And uh, five months later, I got a job. Long story short. That's a pretty short story, if 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 I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Five months is is not a uh, typical um, the the typical lifespan lifespan of a uh, of a self taught engineer. I I am interested. No, was was not, your first yeah. position like closely related to your network, or were you cold applying at first, or how did that position work out? 
Uh, kind of close to, I mean, I didn't really have a network, obviously, having not been, you know, a tech person. Um, but it was part of my network in the sense that it was a friend. Uh, so, you know, basically my friend was in tech. He was working in Square and his girlfriend was working in tech as well at a separate company. And um, they had they had happened to just be hiring um, because they had no engineers. So he recommended that I reach out to her and I did. And I reached out to, um, I reached out to her. She connected me with the CEO and the CEO told me, you know, can you come tomorrow? And I was in Los Angeles and they were based in San Francisco. So I booked a ticket. I went there the next day. I met with the CEO. Then I met with the CTO who put me through uh, two rounds of technical interviews. And yeah, I ended up getting the job. And I was the only other engineer at the time when I joined. Wow. Very cool. So over that short, you know, five month time span, um, mm -hmm. you, I, my assumption is that you must've been cramming. Um, that would, that would just be my general assumption at least. What was your approach to learning during that time frame? And what were some like, you know, challenges that you faced that um, you might think would be generalized towards people learning to code in general? Yeah, so let me let me think here. Um, sorry, the first part of your question was my general approach to learning. Correct. So when I so first uh, I discovered I think in like the latter half of college, you know, for some context, I, I had I had for most of my life thought that I was kind of doomed and destined to be a very just like not average, sorry, lo below average student. Um, standardized testing and all that stuff. I'm not, I'm not good at standardized testing. I think I had, there's something up with my attention span. Uh, when it comes to learning and doing things, I'm just not interested in. Uh, standardized testing had convinced me for most of my life that I was meant to be kind of stupid. And uh, I would all, and the classroom setting just didn't work for me. I didn't have the attention span to listen to, to teachers kind of speak to me. And so, you know, I never made honor roll growing up. I always kind of looked at those students like, wow, like you guys are like the, the league above the rest. And um, so, yeah, I, I always thought I was kind of destined to be bad at school. Uh, I got into I got into a decent college, though, thankfully, through wait list. And because my school district wasn't very competitive, so I barely made it. Um, but once I got in, I discovered accidentally that I was very good at reading textbooks, which is something I never really kind of uh, gave a chance. So thankfully. Uh, I discovered very early on in college that I was a very good self learner and that I had the attention span to sit down and read the books and read the details and kind of learn things, you know, on a deeper level, more than what you can get through just like a 50 minute lecture. So I had a good foundation for self teaching by the time I started my programming, my self teaching programming journey. And my general approach was, um, I needed to treat it like school. Like I needed to treat it as though I were uh, in a boot camp. At the time I was considering boot camp as well, but having after just gotten out of medical school, gotten out of medical school, I was broke. Like I had hardly any money. I was working two jobs, uh, one of which was minimum wage. The other one was me finding clients to tutor. Um, I was tutoring like, you know, chemistry, physics, biology, anything like in high school, AP stuff. But yeah, I was I was working two jobs to make ends meet and uh, and to pay the rent. But, you know, regardless of that, I still needed to treat this as though it were a boot camp or as though this were a accelerated bachelor's program with no GEs where I was just focusing purely on computer science. And what did that mean? That meant six hours a day, right? Um, roughly. So six hours a day and I could take breaks on weekends. And so... Yeah, I just needed to kind of hold myself accountable and stick to a schedule. Um, so regardless of whether or not I was working two jobs, regardless of whether or not I had other hobbies, I needed to get at least six hours in a day for five days a week. And um, yeah, so the, the time allowed me, you know, learning strategies aside, the time really allowed me to kind of bake things into muscle memory because programming at the end of the day you can't develop like a solid intuition for programming unless, uh, especially, you know, having never been a tech guy, having never really been into computers, having never written a line of code until November of 2018. 
I had no intuition for this stuff. Starting cold was incredibly rough. Thinking about Boolean logic even, that was rough. Like it was very hard for me to comprehend that at first because I just did not have the intuition for it. Thinking about things in terms of loops, it was very strange. Uh, my brain just did not work that way. So uh, the six hours a day in the beginning really helped me to kind of develop that muscle. And uh, I fortified it over time by doing, you know, a lot of hacker rank problems. Hacker rank was my, you know, data structures, algorithms, you know, problem website of choice. So, yeah, it was six hours a day for a while. Um, and sometimes, you know, as I got deeper into it, it kind of grew to more than six hours because in the beginning it was just six hours of schooling, right? I just needed to uh, read the books. I watched some courses on, on Udemy. Uh, I watched some courses on YouTube when I couldn't find like a good book or a book that was at the level that I can comprehend at the time. Um, those were a bit harder because, you know, as I said, I'm not very good at listening to people speak, but, you know, watching at two times speed kind of helped for me. But yeah, once I started having like the foundations to start building stuff on my own, that was when it became really fun. And that's when I could dedicate more than six hours because I'm not just kind of like slogging through uh, either a textbook or listening to someone speak. It's like I can get into the zone and get into the flow of building something ridiculous that, you know, I built anything and everything I could. That was, it didn't have to be the next Facebook. I think what's kind of stopped me from building in the beginning was everything had to be a good idea. And then I realized, no, it's like, that's going to stop me from building if I'm going to like stop myself from building things because it already exists. Um, like I'm not trying to make money right now off of this grand app idea, which is some people, what pe some people like to think about before they start building. It's like, oh, how can I build the next great thing? It's like, no, build anything, even if it's stupid, if it serves some purpose for you, or maybe if it doesn't, if it's just to, to meme, um, I did, I made a lot of meme scripts to, you know, I can get into that later, but yeah, just, just building is what you need to do uh, once you have the foundations, once you have your first programming language under your belt, once you have some basic data structures and algorithms, um, you need to fortify everything. You need to put everything you learned into practice. So that's what I did. I built a lot. So um, yeah, I hope that answers you the, the first part of your question, which is, you know, my general approach to, I guess, my self-studies. Um, the second part of your question was some challenges. Uh, I, as I mentioned already, the challenges mainly were due to the fact that I had never been a computer guy. I had no intuition about how computers worked. I had no intuition about programming algorithms and uh, how the computer ticks. So developing that intuition cold from no foundation was incredibly challenging. Uh, I remember trying to think about, I remember when I first did my, when I did my first nested for loop. Uh, and I was iterating through a two-dimensional array. And I my mind just had such a hard time picturing what exactly was happening. And um, but you know, like I said, over time with with time and with problem solving, things started to the muscles started to form. Um and yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I think the more you see something like that happen, the more it starts to make sense. I think, mm -hmm. you know, like even just like understanding for loops at first was like so overwhelming for me. And like the first time I threw a debugger line into my VS code extension and just opened it up the console and like watched it step by step. That was very um, enlightening. I, I like what you said approach, about, yeah. I like what you said about the project thing. Um, I've, I've, as somebody who's like kind of getting to the edge of the point where I, I I'm at the point where I uh, need to start producing projects given my um my current level of education I've gone through like basic html css js and I'm starting to learn react so it's time um I don't know if you've heard of um Nathan Schrader he's on um LinkedIn as well but I had a meeting with him yesterday and it was really nice talking to him because he was like dude just build a, a messenger app like build a replica of a messenger app and that took like so much weight off of my shoulders um, because, yeah, I think there is part of you that does feel like you have to build, if not the next uh, uh, Facebook, you know, uh, something something comparable. So, and that is certainly not the case. You just need to start something and then iterate on it. 
Um, and you can say that as much as you want, but when it comes to actually building it out, I do think there's this external or internal like pressure of this needs to be extremely high quality and a product that I could like package up and sell. And that's not the case up front. So that was a good yeah, there's, reminder. there's, there's no, there's no chance that, you know, at anyone's, I mean, unless you're, unless you're a genius or not, unless you're like the outlier, there's no chance that anyone at that level who is just starting off is going to build something, you know, that's going to, you know, take them to the moon or whatever. Right. Um, so my, I mean, my advice also is on top of just building, instead of just, I guess, sourcing ideas from your head. Um, I mean, earlier I said, just build dumb things. Uh, don't let the fact that it's dumb or that it's done been done before kind of stop you. Um, but this kind of relies on you still sourcing, ide sourcing ideas from your head. If you're learning React, then, and you want to build stuff to, to kind of practice and fortify your understanding of front-end development, what I also recommend is uh, going on some other websites that you use or that you like, such as, let's say, Airbnb, maybe Robinhood. Play around with their website and identify some neat components that you think are kind of uh, interesting. For example, if you go on Robinhood and you click login or if you click down below and you click on their disclosure statement and you see a modal pop up, right, then, you know, I would advise anyone starting off and learning React saying, you know, look at, you know, analyze other websites at that capacity and ask yourself, how did they build this modal component, right? How did they get this kind of like another pseudo web page to overlay the existing one and make it so that you can't click anywhere else but the modal and if you click anywhere else outside of the modal it closes right away mm. um, how did they achieve that and in the process you know of trying to build that yourself you will learn about you know um, z and z indexes and how they work in the browser you will learn about just uh, animations uh, if you decide to animate your modal uh, you will learn about all those things you'll learn about event handlers to close the modal and open the modal so you know Another great way to just figure out what to build if you don't want to source ideas from your own head is to go on other websites and look at uh, their components, inspect the DOM. If you don't, if, you know, inspect the DOM and kind of try to reverse engineer a little bit. Uh, learn, another great way to learn is to look at what other people are doing. So again, um, and what this ensures is, you know, when you're starting off and you're just building things yourself, you don't really have a reference to see like what is a better way to do X, Y, or Z. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're kind of, but you have this great, fantastic world out there where, you know, one, there's a lot of open source code. There's a lot of open source components that you can read. Uh, and there are websites where you can just inspect the HTML and the JavaScript and you can see what they're doing and you can model your own code after what they're doing. So it's always a good idea to kind of like do things yourself and do it very crudely, but then look to see what the professionals are doing. And, um, yeah, learn from learn from the the many giants that have come before you who have had the rigorous debates and the rigorous discussions about how do you build a modal component, for example. Okay. Yeah. That absolutely makes sense. On the topic of professionals, um, you mentioned uh by happenstance meeting uh, an associate of your Tinder date that showed you, you know, the first uh, CLI maybe that you ever saw. Um, while you were learning, did you seek professional help or mentorship uh, from anybody either in your network or out of it, hiring mentors, et cetera? Or would you say that most of your assistance came from what you just mentioned, seeking out these giants who have already made their statements and have fleshed out and debated their specific uh, opinions on things? Because I, I find that, uh, you know, learning to code is very specific like you you come across hyper specific problems uh, in my estimation seeking exterior external mentorship is a great way to mitigate that and and help work through that but i'm curious if you did that in your journey yeah i mean at first i i tried to i guess seek mentorship from my friends who studied computer science while i was an undergrad uh, who had been fully who have been like very established in their careers by the time i started programming but you know it's like I guess a lot of it kind of just fell through. I didn't want to, I guess, um, what's the word, expect or be uh, entitled to their time and all that stuff. So in the beginning, a lot of folks were enthused that I was getting into the field as well. 
Um, so, you know, we can all meet up and like talk about work and tech and all this stuff, which is what, you know, engineers, I guess, sometimes like to do. But yeah, all, all of it kind of just fell through and I never really got like actual mentorship beyond uh, you know, they'll check in on me every now and then and just seeing what I'm doing. Sometimes I have to reach out to them and just show them what I'm building. But I never really got sat down and was told, like, here's what you should be learning or I was never sat down and, you know, taught something. But, you know, I don't hold that against them. I totally understand. Like you said, problems are very specific to what you're doing at the time. And it's not like my problem can be easily uh, explained by someone else who just comes in cold. And because, you know, it's, it's very context heavy. You have to sit down, you have to understand what I'm doing, what I'm learning, you have to understand the stack that I'm using. There's a lot to ask from somebody, um, mm. um, you know, especially since they're just like, let's say two, three or four years into the job. It takes like a long time to develop the sort of intuition needed to jump into any tool and be a generalist and just understand what's going on, even if you don't know the tool, right? It takes a lot of experience to do that. So instead, I turned to uh, strangers on the internet. I, I went to Reddit frequently. Um, I went to, to Discord. So I would encourage anybody to really make use of the community because there's a lot of people out there who really want to help you know, other people. Um, so I, I posted a lot on various subreddits specific to the technology that I was learning. I went on Discord a lot to ask questions about you know, the specific tool I was using. There's, you know, if you're learning Python, there's a Python Discord server. If you're learning Go, there's a Go Discord server. React has its own Discord server. Tailwind has its own Discord server. I mean, I wasn't using Tailwind back in the day. I don't even think Tailwind was a thing, but, you know, that my point is there's a world of people out there who are willing to help you. You won't have, it's going to be harder for you to find a dedicated mentor, but, you know, in the absence of a dedicated mentor, just having like a community is invaluable. If you go through my old Reddit posts, I mean, you'll find like four years ago, me constantly asking folks on Reddit what I should be learning. And um, I went on, you know, the Django or the Ruby on Rails subreddit, subreddit and I asked them very specific questions related to the framework. And that got me very far. Um, you know, of course, yes, it would have been nice to have a dedicated mentor, uh, someone who I can like rely on and have like a consistent channel of communication with and a consistent cadence, but you know, yeah, uh, you can't have it all. It's gotta be resourceful and make use of what you got. Yeah, absolutely. So this was roughly, you know, you were in med school four, four ish years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and now you're a director of engineering. Um, what was between your initial role and where you're at now, um, what was that transition like from an educational standpoint? Um, and why even, why go, why go that route instead of continuing to work in uh, engineering roles? Yeah. So to be clear, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm working for a startup. It's actually the same company that I first joined. Uh, I was with them when it was like a 15 person company. And then we ballooned to like, you know, a hundred at some point. And, um, so I've been with the same company since it's my first ever tech company. Maybe my, maybe my last we'll see. Um, but so the, the journey essentially was I had, I had joined as an intern and uh, the, the deal was three months. So you're, you're, you're the self-taught guy with no credentials. Yes, you did well during the interviews, but we can't, we don't want to invest too heavily in you out of the gates will give you this internship. So I was an intern for about a month in and I worked my ass off and uh, I was using a technology stack that I had no familiarity with. Um, and, you know, I, I worked really hard the first month to be productive and to learn fast. And a month in, they sat me down and they said, you know, we like you. It's clear you're, you're smart. Uh, you work your ass off. Uh, we want to invest in you. We'll just make you a full-time engineer. So my internship was cut short by two months and a month in, I became a full-time junior software engineer. And um, yeah, it was still, I was very uncomfortable with this gigantic code base with all these technologies and all these concepts that I had, you know, not been able to learn on my own because there's a lot of problems that you just don't encounter in school or in your self-teaching. You can only encounter when you come into an existing code base that deals with problems of, let's say, scalability, uh, clients, and um, all that jazz. 
So it was an additional. So my first year was me just being a, a junior software engineer, uh, learning a lot, uh, learning how to reverse engineer a very monolithic code base, again, for which I had still like a very novice knowledge of in terms of the tech stack. And, you know, I was also learning the business at the time and, you know, learning the code and the tech stack is one thing, but learning how to map that now to like a complex business domain. And I work in, uh, you know, financial tech and there's a lot of things that a lot of complex, you know, business domain things in that area, a lot of jargon. So mapping that with the business domains logic was another thing. So it was a year of me reverse engineering and doing a lot of debugging and really sharpening my debugging skills. Uh, by the end of that first year, because again, it was a startup, I had to do a lot of debugging. There's a lot of bad code in startups, a lot of very volatile code in startups. So I really, really sharpened my debugging skills and my reverse engineering skills and being able to figure things out with very minimal context. I didn't get a lot of guidance uh, from my CTO, unfortunately, because again, it was just me and him. And it was, you know, us trying to manage like a lot of people at the time, a lot of uh, customers and clients. By the time I joined, it was like, I don't know. We had a lot of money coming into the application, a lot of users. Uh, but then by the end of the first year, uh, that was when we started to really ramp up the hiring. And, you know, I, I developed some rapport, a lot of rapport with the new engineers. And I, be, having been there, you know, when it was a 15 person, 15 person company with just two engineers, me and the CTO, having seen most of the code base and having a lot of the, you know, skills under my belt to convey this knowledge to other engineers, I got to sharpen my mentorship skills and being able to explain technical things in a way that's digestible to new engineers. Uh, because it's, again, it's not just the technical things you got to explain, how things are set up. Um, it's also being able to explain how this maps to the business logic, right? Um, so I got to sharpen my skills there. And by, you know, close to the end of my second year, it was kind of clear to the, to the founders and the other leaders of, of the company that I had, I guess, a knack for leadership. And so they had made me a team lead in like 2021. And then I led a team of uh, four, in, four or five, uh, four engineers. Uh, yes, I led a team of four engineers, excluding myself where we worked on a lot of user-facing product. And uh, long story short, the jump to director of engineering came when we had hired a VP of engineering uh, sometime in 2021. And we had decided to let him go like six to eight months later because he wasn't, frankly, he wasn't doing a great job. And, um, but, you know, we needed that spot filled. And I had... And it was clear, I had, I had other people tell me in the team, other engineers at the time, uh, we had grown to a team of like, you know, 15 to 20. By the time other engineers had started telling me that, you know, you basically do that person's role. Like you're the one providing engineers with support constantly. You have all the context. You're the first person people think about uh, when it comes to, you know, technical support, when it comes to needing context. And, you know, and frankly, you're also just good at helping us kind of solve our interpersonal conflicts with one another, uh, whether it be, I guess, at the technical level or at the emotional level. So people started telling me that, and I started realizing it as well. And then I had told my founders, um, once the VP was let go, I said, you know, it's going to be very difficult for us to look externally for talent and have this person come in with no intuition for the code base, no intuition for the business, no empathy for the product. It takes a long time to acquire real empathy and real intuition for a product. I've been here now for three years and I'm good at what I do. And uh, I have a lot of rapport with the engineers. Before you decide to look externally for that talent to fill that role that we need, the role of VP, uh, I'm putting my foot forward and telling you that I'm that guy. So I want you guys to consider me. And uh, they said, we've been thinking about that as well. And so we agreed on what my role should be. And I told them that I didn't want the title of VP because frankly, it's like, I'm, I'm too inexperienced. Give me anything else that makes sense to you. They decided on director. And uh, yeah, and that was, and so my, my role as a director became official November of 2022. And uh, the only thing I want to make clear is 
because it's still a startup, because it's still like a 20 person team, it's, it's mostly leadership. I want to say like 70% leadership, but I'm still coding about 30% of the time because I still want my hands on the keyboard. Uh, I still want to code essentially right now. I'm kind of at a place in my career now where I kind of have to decide, you know, is these sort of management leadership roles, you know, is it what I really want or do I prefer IC work being a programmer? My heart is, you know, in programming, I'm a programmer at heart, but I'm also an effective leader. So the question now is which way do I go in my career? And then I had this thought where it was like, you know, I can always code outside of work. I, I maintain like this, you know, pretty sizable open source uh, command line tool that has, you know, almost 2000 stars on GitHub. So it's a passion project that I work on on the side. So I'm still coding and learning on my own, independent of work. I'm a good self-studier. I can learn things on my own. I can source things to learn on my own. Um, work, you know, right now we'll see where I go. But right now I'm totally fine being, I guess, at, in a management position. But yeah, that is, I guess, my my trajectory from intern to director in the span of four years, which is not common. There's going to be a lot of people who are very skeptical about that sort of uh, trajectory. And uh, I've had people, I've asked on Reddit. Again, I went to Reddit when I first became a director. I went on this subreddit called Experienced Devs and I asked for advice. Uh, and I told them my situation and there was a lot of uh, naysayers, haters, whatever you want to call them, who were very skeptical about my title and what I do. There's like, there's no way that you became a director in four years. Like it's, it's, uh, it's theater, whatever your company is doing. But, you know, they're operating on very little context. I, I acknowledge that I'm an outlier in this situation, but, you know, uh, it's, it's my reality and it's what I got to live with. Yeah, that lack of context uh, is definitely a, a key thing when it comes to Reddit. I, I knew I had a feeling, you know, going into you describing your own story and simultaneously operating off of Reddit most of the time that um, you're you're well aware of the of the memes of the person that's been learning to code for three months and lands a two hundred thousand dollar job and all of the <laughs> all of the above. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that wh what would you say? You know, it sounds like you had a, a relatively optimal trajectory into the industry. Um. I'm sure there might be a thing or two that that you might change, but if you were to essentially start over, uh, like what what advice would you give yourself um, starting over? You're in med school or you just dropped out of med school. Um, you know, it sounds like you kind of came across coding partially just as a circumstance of luck. You just happened to meet somebody that kind of fit the bill and 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 showed you this particular path. But in any case, um, it's day one. You're just, you're just learning how to code. You're sitting down at the keyboard for the first time. Is there anything you would change about your approach or anything that you would say generally to people that are trying to do what you did right now? Yeah, I would not change what I did personally. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard because I mean, I, I think the trajectory that I'm on is, you know, it, everything that I already, everything that, every step that I took was conducive to putting me where I am today. And I think that I am very happily placed in terms of my skill set, in terms of my learning and where I am in my career and all that stuff. So I wouldn't necessarily advise myself to do anything different. I just say, just keep doing what you're doing. Um, but it's different when I tell other people, you know, what they should be doing when they're starting off of course i am i have a bias i'm biased towards the thing that have worked for me i'm biased towards just my own journey but i would say you know some advice that i would give a newcomer is first and foremost you need to ignore all of the noise that you see on twitter on on reddit cs career questions whatever like you need to ignore the, the the noise in terms of just the job market. You need to ignore the noise in terms of uh, all the different tools there are for X, Y, or Z. If you are starting off and if you're convinced that programming is what you want to do, then pick a programming language and just learn that programming language. 
And once you've learned that programming language, learn some data structures and algorithms using that programming language, become an effective programmer, uh, learn a little bit about the machine, uh, learn how to use the shell, learn how to do some shell programming, uh, learn how to effectively use your terminal. I would say those three things are the things you need to focus on when you start off. Uh, your programming language of choice, some data structures and algorithms, uh, the terminal. So those are the three things, the bare minimum, I think that you need in order to be an effective programmer, in order to know how to give the machine instructions to produce an output, you know, to that is ultimately to, to give the machine instructions to, you know, achieve your goals. That is all you need to be concerned about starting off. You don't want to inundate yourself with the noise of, oh, you know, if I'm learning JavaScript, I got to learn Node, I got to learn Express after, I got to learn uh, MongoDB, I got to learn React, but then there's also Vue, there's SolidJS. Uh, oh, there's this new thing called Astro. Uh, it's felt like, what am I supposed to do? Do I just learn everything? Um, uh, then there's TypeScript. It's like, no, like that's, I've been there. Uh, being inundated with all this stuff and feeling overwhelmed with just how much there is to learn is going to stop you from learning things properly because you're going to jump from tool to tool and not because you feel this pressure to just know everything. Uh, now we got to learn Docker and AWS. To be an effective programmer, again, you just need three things. Your programming language, some data structures and algorithms, learning how to use the terminal. Everything else kind of just sprouts naturally from that. Um, you know, of course, you know, it's an oversimplification. There, there, there are some extra, if, if you want to go domain specific, you might have to learn a lot of other things, but the bare minimum is just those three things. Everything else will sprout from that. So I think that would be my advice to newcomers. You're for, you're again, assuming you're convinced that programming is what you want to do. Uh, I don't think you should consider the job market because I think that it is ultimately going to be a matter of if not when, sorry, it's a matter of when, not if the reverse, uh, if you're really passionate about the craft, you're going to get a job eventually, even in this precarious job market, because I don't think, you know, given the AI panic, I don't think good programmers are ever going to be out of demand. Good programmers are always going to be in demand, no matter what, regardless of expertise, regardless if you're a junior or mid-level or senior, people want to invest in really good juniors even, right? What, you know, people don't want to invest in is, you know, relevant to this AI panic is an engineer who is easily, I guess, displaceable. If AI can take a design and spin up some React components, and you know most companies are building simple websites that just need simple React components, then unfortunately your skill set's not gonna be valuable. Uh, if a backend engineer or a designer can now ask ChatGPT to write them some basic front-end components, where are you needed in the pipeline, right? If, if your skill set just involves being able to churn out, you know, basic React components. Uh, you need to kind of go deeper. You need to really understand, let's say, React as an abstraction domain. You need to be able to build complex UIs and, and have an expertise that isn't easily displaceable. Again, I don't think good programs will ever be displaceable or replaceable by AI. So the best thing you can do for yourself is to just also to learn things deeply rather than I guess jumping from tool to tool being a generalist and just knowing how to do like the the basics of everything uh jack of all trades or, and such but it's not a bad thing being a jack of all trades in the future once you have like a strong intuition for programming and once you become a very good programmer your 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 being the jack of all trades is a lot of a lot of things isn't going to be a bad thing because you're going to understand things much deeper uh from the get-go um You'll just, you'll just, because of your experience, you can come into a new new tool and have an intuition for all the deeper uh, inner workings of a tool uh, right away. So I guess that would just, that, that would be my advice. Um, reduce the noise, focus on a small set of things that you can learn. Your programming language, data structures, and algorithms, the terminal, focus on that. And um, yeah, and learn things deeply. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think that most of, especially the self-taught developer space is 
noise. Uh, I would say probably 80% of the information on the internet about learning how to program is just noise. So like learning to sort that, like sort signals from, from noise itself is um, kind of difficult because there's always something new that's popping up that's mm -hmm. either concerning or sexy, one or the other, um, that's like mm -hmm. worth chasing or worth stopping learning for. So yeah, I kind of liken the the current market to like kind of similar to how markets in general work. Like <clears throat> a lot of people get scared of investing when markets are are turning downward. When in reality, that's like the best time to start buying high value assets over the long term. And like the skill of software engineering is going to be and continue to be a uh, high value asset in my estimation. And people I would say are probably currently, especially th that are learning undervaluing it um, because there's so many, uh, there's so many seemingly plausible excuses to dismiss the long-term value of engineering in general. So mm -hmm. um, that's kind of probably how I would liken it. So cool. Right on, Benji. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, this insight was great. I know I benefited a lot from it, um, and I'm sure others will as well. Um, where can people find you? Please shout out your Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever you want. I'd love to hear where to find your um, open source project you mentioned, if uh, you'd like to point people in that direction as well. Yeah, uh, I never, I don't memorize my my handles, but yeah, my uh, my Instagram handle is Benji underscore man underscore van. My uh, my Twitter, and I just started Twitter, but my Twitter is at Solidiquis1, so S-O-L-I-D-I-Q-U-I-S, and then one. And um, what was, sorry, what was the other part of your question? Oh, my, my open source project. Yeah. yeah if you just type in uh, er, uh, GitHub Erd Tree, E-R-D-T-R-E-E, -E, it will probably be the first thing you see on Google. Uh, yeah, I've been working on that now for, I've been working on it seriously since the beginning of 2023. I started it sometime in 2022, but I shelved it. And then one day I woke up and it had like a hundred something stars. And I was like, oh, I should probably take this a bit more seriously since, you know, some people are interested in it, uh, which is cool. And then uh, I shared it every time it had a release, I shared it on Reddit and uh, it just got bigger and bigger. And some people are using it. Uh, more and more people are using it. Uh, more and more people are downloading it. And um yeah, it's been kind of it's kind of rough. It's kind of fun, but it's kind of rough at the same time because now I'm working two jobs, uh, right. but you know, one of which I don't get paid. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Cool, man. Yeah, right on. Well, thanks so much for your time again, man. I really appreciate you being here. Of course, man. And uh, yeah, if you have my contact, uh, feel free to reach out for anything. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. I appreciate you listening to the end. Uh, I really had a great time doing this interview with Benjamin, and I'd really like to hear from more of you uh, to get more insight on what it's like getting into tech and just in general, what experiences you are going through and have gone through. I think that all of us can benefit a ton from learning even more about this. So feel free to reach out to me uh, either in the comments or on LinkedIn. You can find me at Colby Jacks on there. And I hope to hear from you soon.